Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast Season 14, Episode 156. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us here this Tuesday, Steelers Nation. Dave, officially our last, what we'll call off-season show, our last show of season number 14. Pittsburgh Steelers reporting to training camp Wednesday, the first practice on Thursday. So it is time for us to put a bow on the 2024 offseason and get ready for Pittsburgh's March here in the summer, into the fall, and hopefully into late January and February. Where'd the offseason go, right? Uh, seems like uh, not too long ago, the Super Bowl was played. And no, not too long after that, I ran off to Nashville and Boston and back home to Pensacola. And But uh, then since then, obviously, we've uh, had all the all-star college all-star games, the draft, the OTA practices, mandy, m- mandatory mini camp, and now we're back after it again. So uh, I guess that would make uh, season 15, episode one, which uh, why don't you tell them real quick kind of what our plans are with this thing, mm-hmm. uh, because obviously uh, we hope you like a lot of audio or a lot of podcasts because the, the, these next three weeks are going to be uh, jam packed with uh, episodes and special edition episodes. Hopefully you like or can at least tolerate the sound of our voices because you're going to be hearing from us a lot here the next couple of weeks. So, yeah, game plan for tomorrow is we won't do a Wednesday morning show. We're going to get back to the Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule, but we're going to wait until after players report after Mike Tomlin talks. Hopefully we get some news out there. We'll do a Wednesday show, probably post that in the evening sometime during the night um, to kind of recap report day. And then for the podcast, the Monday, Wednesday, uh, Friday show, we'll record those usually at night because of the uh, morning practices for training camp now. And we'll do, of course, our daily post-camp recaps that'll go up usually in the afternoon or evening. Those should come out earlier during the week for the 1030 practices, as opposed to the 155 practices that have been common in years past. And so that's the loose schedule show today. Obviously, Uh, we'll do a show late tomorrow and then kind of get into our daily camp episodes with the regular podcast Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and the new season 15. 15 seasons, Dave, that is, I'm sure that was not on your top of your mind when the show debuted all those years ago. Yeah, I, I, there, there were times where I was wondering if I'd make it past two or three episodes <laughs> <laughs> early on there, but uh, uh, here we are, couldn't be uh, prouder, uh, appreciate you know, every, you know the, the listenership that we've been able to build over the years, so... Uh, all right. Next up is uh, uh, report day on 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 Wednesday. So uh, getting getting back in the grind here. Let's just briefly talk about some Steelers news, and there's not a ton of it right now. Will we get a last second contract news here before training camp? I wondered that this morning when I woke up, or, or will it? You know, all these potential extensions for Hayward, for Frymuth, maybe something with Najee Harris. Will those come after players report? So maybe some last second things uh, come down the. The pike for us today, but some tryouts. Pittsburgh uh, NFL was pretty busy on the tryout circuit yesterday as they kind of get their speed dials ready for training camp. Pittsburgh trying out a pair of players in Tory Carter, who's really more of a kind of listed as a fullback or listed as a running back, but really more of a fullback from LSU. A defensive lineman, Marquise Spencer, also in for a tryout. So neither signing the fullback is interesting though given Arthur Smith's system that has generally been fullback heavy in Pittsburgh not really having a true defined old school fullback on the team could see Connor Hayward get work there could see Michael Pruitt go uh, get work there and Jack Coletto is a jack of all trades the closest thing that the Pittsburgh has to a fullback on the roster right now so uh, we'll see if either of those guys get signed once camp gets going and some injuries occur 
Yeah, that's going to be one of the things that we talk about uh, early on in your in, in in the recap podcast, and obviously be scanning your your daily recap diaries, if you will, after practices to see you know how much of a fullback is used uh, during practices and all like that. So uh, interesting, couple of names there that uh, try out, and but not unusual in and of itself because this team will want to have you know uh, guys ready you know in the rolodex and all like that. You know, because obviously you're going to have probably an injury or two, hopefully none. But uh, those things usually happen, and you usually see the roster churn a little bit throughout the uh, next. Uh, you know, I I don't want to say 45 days because that puts us right up to the top of the season, but at least through the training camp portion, uh, and and obviously in 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 through the three uh, preseason games. Pittsburgh's been pretty heavy along the D-line, and I mentioned this in our live stream Monday, and it was just idle speculation, but I've had the thought is could Pittsburgh, that has been pretty D-line heavy overall, adding to the roster and then having this workout potentially be preparing for Cam Hayward hold in? We're kind of transitioning this probably to your, to your top storylines of training camp, things to watch for at the very beginning of training camp. One of those are going to be the contract situations of Kim Hayward, of Pat Fradmuth, of Najee Harris, and assuming that nothing gets done from now until uh, this time the team takes the field Thursday for their first practice in the morning, will there be any hold-ins? Will Hayward hold in and attend but not practice? Will Harris have the same posture? And What about Fryermuth? And so that's going to be, I think, one of the big initial things to look for. Not that it's the end of the world, players hold in all the time. It's a pretty common tactic, but it'll still be a storyline, especially for a guy like Hayward, given his... Uh, age and given his you know clear desire of wanting a new contract and the trickiness of trying to do a new deal with Kim Hayward. Yeah, a lot of these kind of coincide together, these early camp storylines, because, uh, uh, you know, even when it comes to report day, you know, will we see Najee Harris uh, uh, report and then go outside and have one of those eight to 10 minute kind of media sessions uh, because he obviously hasn't talked to the media in some time. I know he had that kind of in fight uh, TV short, you know, interview, if you will, from one of those MMA fights a couple of weeks ago, but really didn't, you know, didn't, didn't, wasn't asked, you know, the tough questions there. So uh, it will be interesting to see if Najee has one of those right at the start of camp. And if indeed he does, Will he be point blank asked, you know, are you, are you considering some sort of hold in uh, here? Because, you know, look, he's had to have watched these uh, running backs around the NFL get paid this offseason. The, the running back market has taken a tick up uh, this offseason. And even though if you were to build a list of potential uh, contract extension players, you know, between now and the start of the regular season, uh, it'd be very easy to put Najee Harris on the back end of those as far as likelihood of that goes. So that, you know, that's, that's one thing to be watching. And as you mentioned, you know, what's going to happen with Cam Hayward here, you know, and, and if Cam Hayward had conducted an early camp hold in, would we even know it? <laughs> because you got a guy veteran, you know, probably not going to be out there too much anyway, especially at the uh, start of training camp because you want to get a look at some of these younger guys uh, on the roster. But then, you know, you got a guy in Cameron Hayward that, that usually in a normal year, it's hard to pull to to keep him uh, off the field for a couple a couple of reps there. Sometimes Mike Tomlin's probably probably got to say whoa instead of sick him when it comes to uh, Cam Hayward. And then Pat Fryermuth, a guy that you know we think. Uh, of all the guys uh, of those three, Hayward, Fryermuth, and Najee Harris, probably the best uh, shot at getting a contract extension. Uh, that's not done at the time of uh, us recording this podcast, and we'll have to see how the rest of the day plays out. Not, not expecting any news to happen between now and you know, the first practice, but that doesn't mean that they couldn't get something done, uh, with, 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 with one of these three guys. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that, you know, that's going to be one of their early camp storylines is any of these guys going to have one of these newfangled hold ins and what's the contract situation going to be with these three moving on through, uh, the rest of the summer. And what do they say, if anything, about their contract situations? As you said, what does Najee Harris say? We don't have any idea kind of what his thoughts and feelings are right now. Cam Hayward, we know his thoughts and feelings, but still would want to, you know, 
hear from him in training camp, given that it's a, a different line in the sand, a different feel than just OTAs that were completely voluntary. And Pat Frymuth, you know, was asked about that during the spring about his contract and he brushed it off and said that's all for his agent. So, uh, but still, we'll hear from him because he's the guy that we think is most likely to get the extension, but we've heard nothing about that happening so far. Now, things can change quickly and Pittsburgh is a very close to the best kind of team and they don't really disclose much and they often are able to push the news about extensions before reporters even get the scoop. So maybe something comes up here very, very quickly, but those are the three names to watch overall. Also, Dave, to watch some injury housekeeping type stuff. Will anyone go on PUP, the physically unable to perform list? That would be the active PUP list, star training camp, or the NFI non-football injury list. Always get one or two surprises each year. And of course, one guy we could be watching for is linebacker Cole Holcomb, especially off Pittsburgh signing Tyler Medikevich. Holcomb suffering that severe knee injury last year uh, against Tennessee. So that's going to be probably the number one name to watch. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if you are, I rolled back to last year to kind of jog my memory, I don't think they had anybody on uh, either the PUP or NFI last year. And it's kind of rare uh, for really any team to be able to get out of the first week of uh, training camp without having you know, to place a player on, 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 on one of those two lists there. So we'll definitely be watching that. I would, I would like to think that Mike Tomlin, when he uh, holds that uh, first press conference on what we think will be Wednesday afternoon after the conditioning test, I would like to think that if any other, any players are going to go on either one of those two lists, Mike Tomlin would announce it. Then the official transaction of such moves might not really be made official until maybe Thursday. It could happen Wednesday, but uh, uh, either uh, I'll say this by Thursday, by the time this team practices, we should know, uh, you know, anybody, if any, uh, going on one of those two lists. And as you pointed out, I, I, I think the real big name to watch here is, is, is indeed Cole Holcomb. And, you know, obviously it'd be a great sign if, if he's not placed on, on PUP, that means they expect him to kind of practice, practice to some degree, right out of shoot. But, uh, as I've kind of stated for several weeks now, I don't think anybody should be shocked because if he does go on active PUP, because of the fact that it's technically been only what about eight full months since he's probably had surgery. So it would make sense for them to put him on active PUP just to bring him along slow, maybe see how he is out there running around for the first week or so of uh, practice and then activate him off of uh, active PUP and then, you know, let, let him get after it from there. But uh, he will probably be the big name to watch. And look, we have gone into other training camps in the past thinking, okay, uh, who who's who's likely to show up on this list on or on these two lists, if any? And then you turn around, and you get a Mika Fitzpatrick that uh, goes on the on the NFI because of you know a, 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 what he fell off the bike or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you you know you you try to speculate and predict as best as you can when it comes to these things, but you know sometimes you get surprises. But uh, it would be. It would be welcome news, obviously, if uh, this team starts training camp uh, without anybody on either one of those two lists. Yeah, that'd be a great way to start off training camp for sure. And semi-related, although we don't expect this man to begin on uh, PUP, but Corey Trice Jr. coming off that uh, torn ACL, five practices in, in the training camp last year, the first padded practice. Uh, what is his availability? Is he going to work in full? Will he be limited to just individual drills? And once the team puts the pads on, which won't be until next Tuesday, will Trice be completely cleared for, for contact and all football activities? Be watching that with him and also with Holcomb. If and when he comes off or if and when he practices, I should say, will he be full go right away? Will he be doing just individual work early? I, I'd be a little surprised if he was 100% full contact, first day of pads next Tuesday. Uh, probably a bit more of an easing, but him practicing alone would still be a big win. But going to watch that for Holcomb and watch the overall participation level for Corey Trice Jr. Yeah, I think it's just more of a finality with uh, Corey Trice Jr. For, uh, for us to officially say he's back, you know, that, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Because obviously uh, that he's he's coming up on the year anniversary, unfortunately, of that uh, knee injury last year. Uh, got some 
what seemed to be positive, you know, at least pictures coming out of uh, uh, OTA and mandatory mini camp and all. And I just think it's news in and of itself and, and, and newsworthy, you know, if he's out there and, 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 and goes through his first practice. So that's obviously something we'll be looking forward to there. What else are we looking forward to, Dave? Cam, Cam Sutton? Yeah, Cam Sutton's first media session. I mean, obviously, Cam Sutton talked to the media right after he was signed, but this was uh, uh, before the NFL laid down that eight-game uh, suspension to him a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you know, I, I would expect him. He's probably going to talk within this first week to the media. Uh, he'll probably keep his media sessions, you know, short and probably few and far between after he does initially meet, meet with him. But interesting to hear his, his side of the eight game suspension being handed down by the NFL and really put, you know, what, what I'm looking forward to is him being asked, you know, what, what went into your decision not to appeal it? You know, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I don't think there's too much to add on to what he's already said, even though, didn't kind of like the kind of context that he used that last time that he met uh, met the media there, but uh, I, I I think him uh, having the media session early in camp, getting it behind him, answering the questions about the eight game suspension, answering the questions about why he didn't appeal it to get that behind him early on in camp would be a good decision on his part. So that that's that's one kind of more minor thing that we're looking for at the start of training camp. Sure, but still worth hearing from him now that that suspension is finalized, now that we know there's no appeal and we know he'll miss the eight, first eight games and will not be able to play until week number 10 because Pittsburgh has a week nine bye. But just a reminder that even though he is suspended, uh, Sutton is able to practice fully with the team in the preseason, participate in all games. We'll see how much they use him, I'm sure, to some extent in preseason action, but he's able to do everything like any other player until cutdowns essentially occur and then he has to go away and be away from the team for a couple of weeks before he can be slowly brought back to the organization. Dave, you have listed as well kind of some positional battles to watch here. The slot watch, and that's referring to the, the slot cornerback position with Sutton, you know, shell for the first half of the season. Who will step up? Will it be Beanie Bishop, Josiah Scott, Braylon Arnold, maybe Anthony Averett, somebody else we'll have to see. So I know first reps can be tricky. Duke Dawson got first team slot corner reps in the first training camp practice last year. It was not oh, wow. the Steelers <laughs> slot corner for 2023, obviously, but still want to see who's in the mix, who begins making plays and uh, who kind of goes from there. Yeah, I think the good news is at least we have finality on Cameron Sutton. So that kind of alerts us already that they're not going to have week one. We know what the NFL stance and the, and the suspension is going to be there. So it, it automatically, and look, I mean, before Sutton arrived, we kind of wondered, well, how's this, how's the slot position going to ultimately uh, play out? So I think this, uh, uh, look, you could go through every position group here and say, uh, uh, Watch this battle. Watch that battle. We we have individual kind of posts already uh, uh, designated to that type thing. But I think if you want to uh, talk about kind of an overarching kind of position battle uh, to watch, uh, you know, as, as kind of a headliner, if you would, it would be the slot position. And and it, you know, I'll be paying close attention to your reports. I'll be asking about you, uh, asking you nightly in our recaps. You know how how you think that uh, uh, battle is going because they are going to need a uh, either by committee or a designated kind of uh, slot guy here, you know, just to, to, to start obviously the first half of the season. Yeah. And then other battles to watch for wide receiver, that number two spot, which will be one of the most intense and competitive battles. You have a bunch of the veterans they signed in Quez Watkins, Scotty Miller, Van Jefferson, the third round pick rookie Roman Wilson, and of course returning Calvin Austin in his third season, he recently spoke on a Memphis radio station, kind of said it was his first real off season because as a rookie, your head spinning. That of course he got hurt as rookie year, was rehabbing, getting ready for a second year. And this year he's going to fully healthy and just fully focused on football. So I, it's such a jumbled up mess right now. And there's always a looming factor of this team adding somebody from the outside. But kind of what is your read on that number two receiver battle out opposite George Pickens before training camp? Yeah, I mean, it, it, 
all, all I can tell you is it's going to be something to watch go go through because once you get past guys like look you you got a good idea of uh, of, of at least three that's going to be on the fifty three right uh, George Pickens Calvin Austin the third and Roman Wilson you get beyond that especially if this team winds up keeping uh, five wide receivers in total. I mean, you could you could make arguments for a couple of guys here. I mean, uh, uh, you could make an argument for Van Jefferson to be one of them. You could make an argument for, uh, geez, you'll go through it. Scotty Miller, uh, Marquez Callaway, uh, Quez Watkins. I mean, there's a lot. Des Des Fitzpatrick even for for special teams reasons. I mean, there there is there is battles to be won there, and I don't think he. You know, I, I think you, if they're drawing this thing out in the uh, in Mike Thomas, you know, uh, uh, office and all him and Omar Khan, because you see these shots on like uh, hard knocks and all like that, how they have kind of these boards drawn up with 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 uh, uh, depth charts and all on them there uh, beyond those top three. You know, I, I don't think they've got anybody's name written in pen, if you will, when it comes to that. So that that you know, the 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 back half of that wide receiver depth chart's definitely gonna be fun to watch play out the rest of the training camp. And then as we've talked, and obviously the speculation's been all off season is will they go outside? And you know, is is one of those guys for those final two spots not on the roster right now? Sure. It'll maintain and continue to be a discussion. I know the Niners report today. We'll see if Brandon Ayuk reports. People probably know by the time they're listening to this and what happens in Portland Sutton in Denver. That contract situation still is an issue, an obstacle in Sutton's mind, but it really has not been talked about or discussed or mentioned much. I, I'm assuming Sutton will probably report, but what he does and where things go from there, it's hard to say. So, and could there be any anybody else that pops up? We'll watch Titans camp with Traylon Burks. What's his pecking order what's his stock alec pierce and indy what does ad mitchell the rookie receiver do if he has a great camp could that push pierce out and put him potentially available so a lot of names to watch here pittsburgh will start here internally evaluate their group see what they can do and then proceed from there for any potential external options all right and then finally dave you have listed on your top storylines to watch for the start of training camp mike tomlin's first press conference which will occur on Wednesday afternoon, we'll recap it for the Wednesday show uh, tomorrow evening, and we'll just see what he has to say. As you write, typically he's never giving you any earth-shattering information, but it's still good to hear from Tomlin and get his thoughts on whatever he's asked to begin training camp. Yeah, we don't normally get anything earth-shattering, but you know, I, I like I said at the top there, I would imagine he'll he'll hopefully tell us about who might go on a couple of, you know, if, if players need to go on either PUP or NFI list, uh, those would be identified. It's always fun to hear him talk. Uh, you know, you can go through probably six questions that'll be asked that he's asked annually. You know, who are the, you know, what's your thoughts on the second year guys and the jump that they're supposed to make, obviously be asked about some of the rookies and, you know, I, I'm not expecting earth shattering news, but you can guarantee whatever Mike Tomlin does say on Wednesday after Noon that we'll parse thoroughly and find a few talking points to pull out of there. Speaking of that, I should mention you also have listed on here the rookie watch in, in Pittsburgh traditionally allows the veterans and returning players to get initial reps over the rookies with some rare exceptions. I think Marquise Pouncey in training camp, Nashi Harris more recently, guys that were basically running first team wire to wire in their first training camps, but does Troy Fogg, Tano, does he work first team right tackle or will it be Broderick Jones or will it be Dan Moore, Zach Frazier versus Nate Herbig at center who gets the initial look there? What is Roman Wilson's posture? Is he going to work first team? Is he going to work slot? Is he going to work outside? Uh, how does that inside linebacker rotation look with Peyton Wilson? All those kinds of things we'll be watching for very closely. Yeah, absolutely. It's always fun to monitor the pecking order, especially when it comes to these rookies, especially when it comes to the rookie draft picks at the top of the class there. And uh, Fau Tano and Zach Frazier, uh, you know, you, you expect those guys to see the field, obviously, sooner rather than later with the Steelers. I think there's probably a, a slightly better chance that Zach Frazier is a week one starter, maybe a little bit more so than Fautano, but that doesn't mean that uh, both of those guys won't be uh, in the starting lineup come week one when this team goes on the road and plays the Atlanta Falcons. But, you know, just watching the pecking order and, and you know, how these guys are able to maybe move up and get more reps, even the guys at the bottom, guys like uh, 
uh, uh, uh, Ryan Watts and guys like Logan Lee and, and kind of fun to just monitor that over the course of the next uh, 40 or so days. Sure. There'll be reps there plenty for Watts. Pittsburgh only has six safeties right now as they've cut a couple this offseason. And Trenton Thompson, who worked out for Carolina yesterday, by the way, did not sign. And they also cut Jalen uh, Elliott recently to make room for Tyler Medikevich. And so watch get plenty of reps as he makes the switch from corner to, well, I don't know if it's going to be play free safety, strong safety, but safety regardless. Mason McCormick probably gets some second team work. And so we'll see how he does there. And yeah, just, you know, the way the NFL set things up, they had this ramp up period. The first four days have to be padless. And so it still has an OTA type feel. We'll of course evaluate, analyze, itching to do so. But I always try to take the first couple of days as more inventory on who's running where, depth chart, alignment, and you know who's lining up in what different positions and personnel groupings, those types of things, just to get a good foundation. And so when things change, because depth charts are not set in stone this time of year, I'm just kind of able to uh, analyze and acknowledge and be able to react to any changes in depth chart once the pads come on and evaluation kind of starts really ramping up. So that's usually my approach the first couple of days of practice. And we'll be watching to see where in what order the rookies are running in. We've learned over the years to only uh, uh, slightly overreact, right? <laughs> slightly, just a little bit. You got to have a little overreaction. We're, we're Jones in for some football. So right. uh, we'll have our full reports though each day. And so you guys can check that out to get the full breakdown because I like like having that full picture for you guys to try to uh, avoid my potential bias of just a couple of highlights, but we'll always have at the end of each post of each camp diary, kind of a too long, didn't read just bullet points for the highlights of the day uh, for the you know people that want to just get a quick digest of what uh, the day was like. And then I'll have my full just novel of nonsense uh, above for you guys to check out as well. Yeah. Look, I mean, if, if people that have, you know, follow the Steelers Depot and listen, you know, to, to particularly the, you know, special edition podcast and all like that, read the, uh, Alex Kazora, you know, daily recaps and all like that, you know, there, e- even for me, Alex, and I say this every year, you know, someone that doesn't go to camp and, you know, I would imagine quite a people that listen to the show don't go to camp, uh, you kind of, you know, when, when reading the camp reports and then obviously, uh, uh, us talking and me asking you questions about the position groups on, on nearly a daily basis there, as we go through this, that helps paint a picture in my mind, what's going on kind of, uh, uh, you know, I start taking notes off of what your notes are and what you tell me. And then by the time that first preseason game rolls around. I've got a lot of specific things that I start looking for uh, within those games, whether it be, you know, uh, pecking order, you know, who's playing with what unit, what, you know, what side maybe those guys are playing. And then obviously when you get into special teams watching, you know, who's, who's getting the burn there. So it's very, very useful just even not being there at the training camp practices. And look, you know, a lot of my determinations of what I think the roster might direction might go to or made once we get into the preseason games mm-hmm. but even leading up into that you know I get a good idea what to look for in those games just based on the information that that you know you push out during training camp so that's look it, it's an exciting time of year no lie sure oh yeah it's a great time I'm, I'm the off season you get very bored by the end of it especially this real dead period that we've just gone through kind of since the fourth of July and so Excited for some actual football talk, evaluation, analysis to, to start. Yeah, just as an explainer for those who are, are new to the site and new to reading our, our training camp reports, the reporting that I do, which is a, a really kind of complete log play by play, is probably overkill. I admit that. But my goal, as Dave said, is to make it feel like for those who can't attend practice because Steelers Nation is all over the country, all over the world. And so not everyone can end up in, in La Trobe like I'm able to go to every day. Uh, I want you to feel like you're sitting right next to me, like you were at practice. And, and so that's kind of the the reason, the method behind the madness. And then, of course, we uh, you know still analyze and talk about the specifics. But that's that's why the reports are so lengthy, the way they are set up, the way that they are. The feedback has always been in, encouraging in that sense to push towards that as opposed to a more cliff notes and abbreviated version of the report. And so we will continue as you guys continue to enjoy and ask and want to read it that way. All right. Uh, those are the kind of the early storylines to pay attention to once training camp gets underway. Where to from here? 
Let's do our roster predictions. We have our pre-training camp roster predictions that I'm sure will be 100% correct here before uh, for, for week number one. Uh, I think they're generally, as most are, pretty similar, but our, I know our predictions have a couple of differences, not only from the last time that I, uh, I did my prediction, but our own predictions versus one another. So let's kind of go through position group by position group to see where we're the same and where we are different. We are the same, of course, at quarterback, like I'm sure most people are keeping three and Russell Wilson. Justin Fields, and Kyle Allen. Of course, all eyes, especially nationally, will be on the Wilson-Fields battle, although I think locally, and you would probably agree, Dave, it's less of a battle and competition as it is Wilson almost de facto having the job. Yeah, I think the biggest storyline here is uh, a rebuilt quarterback room. I mean, all, all four of them, even John Rice Pump, Plumley, uh, uh, you know, the, the, all four quarterbacks are new to this team, and when is the last time that, is that when is the last time that's happened not only in Pittsburgh but across the NFL where you've had Great question you know uh four guys that you bring to camp at the quarterback position all be new to the team so that's it that's the storyline uh there uh no surprise that we do not have a difference there with the three that we think this team will keep uh, I think other than injury those are going to be the three uh I, I'll be quite shocked if Russell Wilson is not the week one starting quarterback. I, I know you agree with that as well, too. But just to, once again, the, the storyline here is you have four new quarterbacks in this quarterback room to open up camp with. Right. That is the headline. It's a complete departure from last year's group of Pickett, Rudolph, Trubisky, and also Tanner Morgan was the fourth string quarterback for those playing at home. And want to know who the four string quarterback was last year. I, I think Fields will have a good summer. I'm going to write about this for probably uh, Wednesday or Thursday. I think he will impress with the physical talent that he has, the arm talent, the legs against backup defenses. I think he will shine, but I don't think it'll be enough to take away the job from Wilson for week one in Atlanta. Here's the thing. You've got three quarterbacks here with a lot of experience and you expect to see all three of these guys during the preseason, right? And mm -hmm. uh, it would it will probably be a minor miracle if if Plumley even takes a preseason snap. Not impossible, as I like to say, but any snaps that he that he does get will probably, if any at all, be few and far between. Where am I going with that? Well, you've got three experienced quarterbacks here that not only have played a lot in preseason games over the years, but in in you know even Kyle Allen has got some regular season snaps. I guess. The, the, the big takeaway here, especially in, in, in preseason, we talking about practice, you know, <laughs> not, uh, a game. But not a game, but practice, practice game. It will be surprising if this team loses a preseason game. That's 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 it. That's the take. OK, I mean, I don't know. You get in the preseason games. You never know how they're going to go. And I know last year was was fool's gold on how well the offense, the first team offense did in that situation. But, yeah, I think it's a good roster overall. So. I mean, I I had thought about what the record's going to be, but hopefully they're able to move the ball. Hopefully Fields, when he gets in, into the game, is able to move the ball and have success. I think he will. And sure, yeah, you're, you're a quarterback. Uh, you know, the, the the players that you put out there around him obviously make a difference, especially later in 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 in, in these preseason games. But I mean, you've got three quarterbacks with experience here, so I you know I'm I'm expecting them to roll through the preseason uh, pretty well again. But well, like you said, though, we, we got fooled into uh, being kind of lulled to sleep with what happened last year during the preseason. But, you know, just as a whole, I'm expecting good things out of the quarterback sure. position during the sure. preseason. No, it's a fair point. And Pittsburgh values their experience. I think that's why they wanted to sign a Kyle Allen. They liked having three experienced quarterbacks last year, although the play was not tremendous. But they just like the experience of their third string quarterback, Mason Rudolph, having uh, Sunday uh, experience and and showing that he can win in the NFL. Just a cu uh, couple of quick notes here. Will Plumley do anything other than quarterback to try to maximize his reps? He got some kick return work kind of on the side in OTAs. Will that continue in the training camp? Will this team show any sort of specialty packages for Justin Fields in training camp, or will they kind of hold that until after camp breaks and for the regular season? The latter probably more likely, but we'll be watching for it, especially in seven shots and those type of environments. And will Wilson get any rest days? He's a 35-year-old quarterback, but he's new to this team. He needs to maximize his reps. Will he get the Ben treatment of kind of full day, half day, off day? Probably not to that extreme, but will he occasionally get a rest day? And if he does, that will give Plumlee some reps, some opportunity, and that'll be uh, big for him. So I'll be watching for that with Wilson as well during camp. Unless he, unless he, 
has any fatigue, I think it's going to be hard to keep Wilson out of practices, to be honest with you. Sure, I agree. I think my prediction is he won't really rest at all the first couple of weeks. Maybe that towards the end of camp, he'll get a little bit of rest time or maybe he won't go he'll still practice, but maybe not go full all, all team sessions one day to give Plumlee an opportunity. But uh, yeah, I think generally Wilson will be out there and pretty active this, this training camp, as he well, should. Will Plumlee last on the roster all throughout the offseason? Yeah, or will he get a little dokened, as to, to use my uh, verbiage for it? Uh, yeah, we'll see. Again, can he do anything else? I mean, I you know was speculating when they first signed him, will, will he play a different position? Pittsburgh has been adamant he's a quarterback, but he was a receiver partially at his time in college and trying some kick return stuff. And so I, I don't know. Um, you know, uh, he, an interesting prospect, but uh, the reps will be hard to come by. All right, running back. Both keeping three here in Najee Harris, Jalen Warren, and Cordell or Patterson. Group feels pretty set in stone. Of course, just watching Harris on the contract. How much will these guys get work in the training camp, especially the live run sessions once the pads come on? Probably not a ton. Harris, more want to keep those guys good to go for week one. And Patterson's 33 and knows the Arthur Smith system. He'll get some work, of course, but uh, probably going to be, I would consider it a light training camp for Harris, Warren, and even Patterson. I've said it several times. If I'm Najee Harris, I'm not doing a damn thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. I might go through a couple of those drills on the side, you know, uh, where they try to knock the football out. Or, but other than that, uh, I and I wouldn't blame them if that's a look. Uh, as as Heinz Ward would say, uh, take your hat off and hand it to him if uh, if he if he if he doesn't have a hold in. Yeah, again, even if he doesn't hold in, I think Pittsburgh will be very careful. He was. Basically, never tackled in training camp last year. He went he went through every practice or the practices he did participate in. But, um, you know, they were very careful making sure he was ready because in 2022, he got hurt like the first day of padded practice with that toe injury that dogged him through the first half of the regular season. And they need these guys to be healthy and available. Harris Warren, the run game is going to be the central component of this offense. The O-line has to do their job, of course, but they want Harris and Warren good to go for week one. Uh, obviously, the undrafted rookie out of Georgia, J- Dejon Edwards, is a name to watch. Jonathan Ward's got some experience, NFL experience, uh, going to probably get some a uh, little bit of work during training camp in the preseason. Uh, even uh, uh, LaMichael P. Ryan's got, got a little bit of a uh, cup of coffee in the NFL so far. So uh, you got a pretty good top to bottom uh, running back depth chart here to play with uh, during the preseason. Uh, but when, when the dust settles, I'll be pretty shocked if they keep more than just these three. Yeah, I think there's intriguing talent in Edwards, who's a little Jalen Warren light. Uh, Ward's a guy that has well-rounded ex- experience. He can catch, he can run. P. Ryan's got some NFL experience as well. I think it'll be tough to compel this team to keep a, a fourth actual running back. Could they keep a fullback? We'll talk about that here in a second. By the way, Jonathan Ward, they, I haven't told you this, he he's read Steelers Depot in my Steelers uh, Deconstructing the Roster series where I put uh, percentages of guys to make the 53. I put Ward at 5%, which, by the way, was the highest of the running backs, higher uh, than Edwards, higher than P. Ryan. But I saw Ward in an Instagram uh, post uh, have that highlighted with uh-oh. my 5%. Uh, Jonathan was like, uh-oh, he's seen my stuff. He's unhappy. But uh, we're he's using us as some motivation, which as he should. Hey. Uh, Good on him for that. So he is using that. And I, ho- I hope he proves me wrong. I thought he was a guy that would get signed out of rookie minicamp. He did. There's some talent there. The path to the 53 is just tough when you have established guys and Harris and Warren. And then your kick returner, Arthur Smith guy and Patterson. But more power to Jonathan Ward. Hey, our job is to speculate. Hopefully he doesn't get mad. You know, hope, hope, hopefully players don't get, you know, take it too terribly personal when we you know, give our assessment and our speculation on this. If they have to use it as a motivation, have at it, you know, sure. uh, uh, obviously wish nothing but the best to all these mm-hmm. you know, guys that show up, uh, here, but, uh, uh, it just, it, it does feel like something has to happen for Ward to make the, uh, 53. Right. Practice squad, a real possibility for him, for Edwards or P Ryan, the 53, that was a different, uh, case altogether. Fullback. I don't have a true fullback. You don't have a true fullback. We'll see if they use anybody. Hayward, Pruitt, Coletto. Coletto, if he you know impresses, could he have a, a sleeper potential to make this team losing some fullback surprise and make the roster before guys like Rosie Nix, 
So this one's open-ended, but neither of us keeping an actual fullback right now. Yeah, I kind of have that position group grouped together, tight end slash fullbacks, because I'm mm-hmm. interested to learn, you know, from your reports and all and others that, you know, how, you know, uh, to what degree maybe they might use one. And we, we like to think that we will see a fullback in the backfield at some point during the 2024 season. Just how much is kind of yet to be determined on that. So that's why I kind of group those together. Uh, Look, you know, Coletto's a guy, obviously, to watch within this. Michael Pruitt coming over from, from Arthur Smith has spent some time kind of in that role. Uh, very occasionally, we've seen Connor Hayward line up back there. So, I mean, you've got candidates. It's the, the big story when it comes to that tight end slash fullback group, I think, is, you know, what's the total number when you combine those two positions together, if you will, that they wind up keeping and beyond Pat Farmuth, Darnell Washington, and Connor Hayward, I consider all those three locks. I would imagine you do as well. What what does it look beyond that? Uh, we're kind of skipping ahead of the wide receivers here, but uh, I have I, I'm I'm a Rodney Williams fan, and I'm a fan because of the special teams uh, play with that. Uh, he is younger than Michael Pruitt. Uh, you, when, when they signed Michael Pruitt, I understand the signing. I am behind the signing. Um, uh, the contract's cheap, all like that. Obviously has experience with uh, Arthur, uh, uh, Arthur Smith. But I, I think you're a little bit higher on his tape to date than I am. All that said, I think that he, Michael Pruitt has a legitimate shot at a roster spot. Uh, I just kind of did a, a, a fence point, if you will, and I chose to keep Rodney. I'm keeping four in total uh, with those with those two groups combined. Pat Farmer, Darnell Washington, Connor Hayward, and Rodney Williams. And that has me having Michael Pruitt uh, on the outside looking in. Uh, I believe you have Pruitt in that group, though, right? Right. Our first disagreement of our pre-training camp roster predictions, I have Fryermuth, Washington, Hayward, and Pruitt over Williams. I do think it's right now a literal coin flip 50-50 between Pruitt and Williams, a, a, a underrated and smaller importance, but a camp battle nonetheless between those two guys. Williams is younger, the better athlete, the better on special teams. Pruitt has the Smith experience in that system. He's followed him around his entire career, essentially, as uh, Pruitt has with Smith. And I think the better inline blocker, even if, and I, I get your point that you're not as high on Pruitt's blocking as I am, although I'm not like super high on it, I think he's a competent blocker. He is, I think, a still a better inline blocker than Rodney Williams. Would you agree with that? Yes, yes. Okay. I, I think where Rodney can, where Rodney shines the most is more on the move. Right, right. And I think with Hayward not being a great inline blocker, Frymuth being an average at best inline blocker, you do have Washington, but I think the team will value the inline blocking of Pruitt a little bit more than maybe the special teams value that Williams would bring over Pruitt. Okay. And that's probably where the battle is, is the blocking mm-hmm. versus the special teams value when it comes to those two. And now if Williams can show he can block, then he's probably going to make this team because he's younger, he's more athletic, and Pruitt's not going to be somebody who's going to function on special teams. How old's Michael Pruitt now? 32? 32, I believe. He's getting up there, yeah. Okay, and I believe he's ve- he, uh, he's obviously uh, vested as well too. So if he makes the fifty-three man roster week one, not only does he get that what is it fifty thousand dollar roster bonus, but I think his uh, his salary becomes fully guaranteed too. Right, right, it would. All right, at wide receiver, we have a disagreement here as well. Uh, we're both keeping five, but different five, and I'm keeping George Pickens, Roman Wilson, Calvin Austin the third, Van Jefferson, and Des Fitzpatrick as my number five. You're keeping the same. Top four and Pickens, Austin, uh, Wilson, uh, Van Jefferson, but keeping Scotty Miller as your number five. So why Miller is the number five? Thing? Uh, I have a feeling when I kind of map this out that get into a, a, a game day, one of these guys could the one of these back end guys of the roster could wind up being an, an active player, you know, mm-hmm. Uh, and I understand, I, I see where you're keeping Des Fitzpatrick and I would imagine there's a lot of special teams, uh, uh, reasoning behind that. And I certainly do understand that. Uh, look, I'll be upfront with you. 
I don't know how it's going to play out past those <laughs> top three. <laughs> secret. <laughs> Let's in a secret. I don't know either. <laughs> uh, I don't. I mean, it could. It, it, this could go so many different ways once you get past these top three. I I feel pretty good that they're going to keep five in total. Uh, you, you, you obviously agree at this point as well, too. Uh, just who are the, you know, if indeed five is the number who are going to be, I, you know, look, I'm, I'm not married to Van Jefferson. I've got a lot of questions about him. I got a lot of questions about Scotty Miller. I got a lot of questions about Quez Watkins. I got a lot of questions about Des Fitzpatrick. I got a lot of questions about Marquez Callaway. I mean, got a lot got, of questions. Yeah, I got a lot of. I mean, there are a lot of questions about sure. about those guys. Past look, Roman Wilson's going to be on the roster. We know that. George Pickens going to be on the roster. We know that. I'm ninety seven, ninety eight point nine percent sure Calvin Austin is going to be on this roster. It's just, you know, how how different will I feel about the final two of these five even come the first preseason game? Yeah, it could be completely differently, and and but but any any reason for Miller over Quest Watkins or Fitzpatrick or Callaway, just anything that made you give at least the, the slightest edge to Scotty Miller. I just Scotty Miller's got got experience with Arthur Miller. He's a he's a more versatile kind of player, chess piece that that you can move around. He can do a lot of things. I think uh within that so to me it's more about what he can do on offense versus what say a des Fitzpatrick can do on offense we're back to kind of like we just had the conversation about the tight end group mm-hmm. you, know, you got rodney williams and his special teams play versus the blocking of uh uh michael pruitt i kind of a similar situation here what can one guy do on the field for you offensively versus what one guy can give you on on special teams that uh, and and once again i when when, when thinking about this deeper at least hypothetically, I kind of wondered if you got to week one and things, you know, the health of the roster was there. And as is right now, might that fifth wide receiver end up being just inactive? You know? Sure. I think it's it's distinctly uh, possible and plausible. I want Fitzpatrick. It, yeah, you're right. It's basically my Rodney Williams of a guy that's going to bring the special teams value. You got two wide open gunner spots right now. James Pierre's gone. Miles Boykin's gone. They had assumed the gunner roles the past two years and did a nice job of it. You have just total new competition there. You're going to have multiple people competing in, in, in Trice, in Rush, in Fitzpatrick, probably Ryan Watts. Some others will be involved as well. But Fitzpatrick really came on strong late in the preseason last year and probably earned his roster spot through in-stadium work as a gunner, making tackles, downing punts. That was impressive. And that is a different, in, in a veteran receiver room with a lot of the same kind of body types and, and skill sets and those types of things with Watkins and Miller and Austin, Jefferson, Fitzpatrick brings something different. He brings special teams value, brings coverage value. The other guys really don't. And that may give him an edge ultimately for that number five spot that is ultimately not going to play on offense that much anyway. All right. All right, offensive line here. We are keeping both nine. I think it's the same nine, correct? Uh, I'm keeping Roderick Jones, Troy Fautanu, Dan Moore Jr., Dylan Cook at offensive tackle at uh, guard, Isaac Sayamalu, James Daniels, Nate Herbig, Mason McCormick, and Zach Frazier. Then it's the same nine as you, correct? That is the same nine, and it's hard to make. I mean, I, I, I can listen to an argument to keep one less or one more on this, but typically the way these things I think have been shaping out, look, because you have to have eight dressed for games, right, in order to uh, take advantage of uh, the only the, the, the dressing of, what was it, 48, I think. So you yes. have to have eight offensive linemen dressed for games. So... You know, you're, you're because of that, you're at least probably going to keep nine. It's just the way the the, the you know, rosters are built around the NFL, and because of how the, the Steelers like have have a few guys that have some versatility, nine seems like the number. And it's hard, hard, hard to argue, in at least from where we sit right now, uh, with the these nine that each of us have for obvious reasons. I mean, several of these guys are going to be there. I mean, just write them in pen. Uh, I guess the conversation gets it. I mean, even Mason McCormick. I mean, you don't go out and spend. I mean, we've seen it before that 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 a uh, that a player you know drafted you know fourth round not make the roster, but it would be quite an upset if a guy like Mason McCormick did. You you really have to question the evaluation if uh, 
if he did not make the 53 man roster. And then really the, the, you know, there'll be conversations, I guess, or speculation conversations about Dan Moore Jr. and his, uh, whether or not he might get traded at the end of this thing. Uh, before week one, I, I could listen maybe to some of those. Nate Herbig technically is really your best option right now as a backup center at this point. So it's hard to imagine him going anywhere. And then you get into the uh, Dylan Cook conversations. Uh, it feels like he's on the inside uh, of the bubble right now uh, to be you know, that additional tackle. And look, he can, uh, are we going to see Dylan Cook get some guard reps again? You know, sure. uh, uh, like we saw last uh, last year, you and I were one of the few ones around the landscape saying, watch out for this Dylan Cook. And really, it mm -hmm. was more so me once the preseason got underway. I thought his tape was pretty damn decent uh, last year during the preseason. And not only that, they moved him around positionally. You could kind of read if you if all you had was just the charting and the charting alone from last year's preseason games. Dylan Cook stuck out for just when he was playing in games and where he was playing in games. And then you turn on the tape and I thought he represented, it's no wonder that he made the 53 man roster. So these are my nine. Uh, those are your nine. And I, I, both of us have uh, last year's uh, late round pick Spencer Anderson on the outside looking in. And I kind of view him as a guy that barring injury, probably going to end up on the practice squad. I think that's where it stands right now with Anderson, but he had a good, you know, uh, for a seventh round pick to have a good camp. He was versatile. He was on the roster the entire year. I mean, that's no small feat for a seventh round guy. I, I wanted to try to find a place for him. I just couldn't find a spot for Anderson as a 10th offensive lineman, but an injury. What if Troy Fautanu has a really good camp and Dylan Cook shows he could be a swing guy? Could Dan Moore be on his way out? That takes a lot of steps and levels to get there. And that's not going to get answered until late this summer, but you know, what if what if a spot opens up and Anderson, maybe he makes his way onto the roster still. So it's a it's, it's a overall on paper, a good and strong and deep offensive line room. Yeah, if there's an overhang here at Spencer Anderson, uh that that could very well wind up on the on, on the fifty three for for se several reasons that you just mentioned. If I told you if I had a crystal ball, Dave, and said one of the nine on our predictions these offensive linemen will not be a stealer week one which of the nine do you think is most likely to not be a stealer uh i would just say dylan cook because he is kind of in that backup uh gotta earn it again role okay that's fair i'll say dan moore i'll say if something happens i still think the odds of trading him are low but not impossible and you've kind of made the uh, the comparison to, to kevin dotson in a sense just in terms of maybe a guy that ends up losing out on a role and a real purpose that ends up creating some trade value for him. Well, look, if Dylan Cook outplays Dan Moore in this thing, you know, then you really got to take a hard look at Dan Moore because, I mean, he, he's not on a cheap salary. Are you really going to uh, allocate funds that way to have him be a uh, – uh, he'd probably be your inactive guy. And you're going to lose him after the season. Last year's right. rookie contract, you're not re-signing him. He's going to be playing somewhere else next year. So there's, there's certainly value in keeping him and having experienced left tackle depth. Pittsburgh, I think, will value that. But uh, potentially, he could be on the way out. Yeah, McCormick, there had been a couple fourth-rounders to not make the team out of camp. Duran Grant, Greg Gibson, Danny Farmer. But they're far and few between. I think right. McCormick makes it, especially this team seems to be allowing James Daniels to play the season out and go somewhere else next year. So I think they're looking at McCormick as a hopeful heir to a, a starting guard position. Yeah. And with him too, I, I, we had this kind of talk last year about Spencer Anderson and the center capability and how much of that we will see. And we ended up not really seeing much of it, if any, hardly any at all. What he was out there kind of warming up a couple of times, I think in practices at center, right. Spencer Anderson was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you, you circle back to the amount of snaps that McCormick played at center during his college career were very, 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 very few uh, within that. So it would, you know, not saying that you won't see McCormick out there in practice, maybe ahead of practice, taking some snaps at center. But I, I think the onus on him is to get him fit at both guard spots. 
even if we assume the the Frazier is the starting center week one, there are some questions on the backup. I mean, Herbig is a is a guard, and I, I'm sure he took a bunch of center reps last year during the season in practice. But he got hurt in training camp last year, or in the, maybe the first preseason game, and and he really couldn't play the rest of the summer. And he just started getting some center reps, and then was was shelved. And so, don't really know much about Nate Herbig, the center, and that'll be right. something to watch for as well. Yeah, especially during the preseason. Now, look, you're going to try to get Zach Frazier a lot of snaps during the mm-hmm. preseason, I would imagine, within that. But it's not like he's going – like Zach Frazier is going to be out there for 62 snaps in, in, in all three preseason games. You're going to have to get a look at, 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 at you know, a few other guys. Nate Herbig should – get his fair share uh, in there. And Ryan McCollum also probably going to get, you know, a handful of snaps late in games uh, as that last center in the game. Last question for the O-line. Thursday's practice, first snap a team, 11 on 11. Who's the first team center? Probably uh, Nate Herbig, just so uh, Zach Frazier's not over there smelling himself. <laughs> okay, I agree. I agree. All right, defense here. We're keeping defense alignment. We're I'm keeping six. You're keeping seven. So a difference here. We have the same initial six of Cam Hayward, Larry Okunjobi, Dean Lowry, Isaiah Loudermilk, Keanu Benton, Montrevious Adams. You're going with a seventh in DeMarvin Leal. If there was one position group that immediately after pushing publish, uh, that I would go back and 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 change. It would maybe be this group. Uh, and in lo- look, if you subtract from one group, you got to add to another, right? Especially you know if you're going to keep your splits the same. Which you know, I have 24 on offense and 26 on defense. I know you have the same split as well too. But if I was going to change this up one bit, I would go six defensive linemen and one more safety. Uh, uh, overall, because I only have them keeping four on mine. Uh, it's just a more of, you know, look, at a minimum, they're keeping six, right? Yeah, they usually keep six. Last year, they did, did keep seven, though. So right. that, that, there is some precedent. So maybe there's some recency bias that played into that overall. Uh, I think the key thing when it comes to this group is what's going to happen between louder milk, the, the three L's, Louder milk, Leal, and Lee. Uh, make that the, the 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 new law firm to keep an eye on uh, uh, this year in training camp. Uh, Louder milk is what he is at this point. I think he's played the run well at times during his career. I think we've seen that patented kind of push pull of his as far as a pass rusher, few and far between. But he is kind of what he is at this point. Uh, Leal has left a lot of uh, desire uh, for us to this point after his first couple of seasons here. He really needs to take that next step and it be definitive. I don't think he's guaranteed a roster spot. And then obviously you got a late round pick in Logan Lee, who I kind of view uh, really would need something to happen. Even if they only kept six, I think, you know, he would definitively have to beat out either a louder milk or a Leal. Mm -hmm. Those are low bars if you really want to talk about it, but I mean, he still has to get that done. Uh, So, and this is more of I am, I am very uh, fluid on this position group as far as whether it be six or seven, but you have to have a starting point of some sort. So until I see someone separate or not separate or, or whatnot, I have seven. So of all the L's, you have Logan Lee holding the L, as the kids say, right? right? Not making the team. Gotcha. Right. And I have him to the practice squad. Gotcha. I do as well. I have Leal off completely. He's got to be Leal. He's got to be the Motel 6, David. The light's got to be left on for him. He, he, this is the year for him, make or break. It seems like he recognizes that. We talked about this in the live stream on Monday. Uh, Terrell Austin has praised him. He seems to be in good shape, but he's got to put everything together. He's off scholarship. This is do or die for DeMarvin Leal. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Inside linebacker, we are keeping the same five here in Patrick Queen, Landon Roberts, Peyton Wilson, Cole Holcomb, and Tyler Medikevich, the latest and last edition that leaves Mark Robinson off the roster. Yeah, I kind of had a change of mind here when putting this together. Obviously, my 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 top four were set in stone in Queen, Roberts, Holcomb, and Peyton Wilson. 
uh, the recent signing of Matt Akavage and what he brings to this team uh, in special teams cannot be ignored. Obviously, you don't want to get into situations where Tyler Matikavich has to be on the field for defensive snaps, much if any. Mark Robinson's left uh, has not really lived up to the rookies, you know, kind of uh, hype. He's had his moments. He just hasn't played a lot. The team doesn't sound uh, considerably high on him. Matikavich is a better special teams player of the two there. So the big question mark overall, when it comes to this inside linebacker group in entering training camp is what's the, what's the status of Cole Holcomb, you know, mm-hmm. and, and we covered that early on in the show. If Holcomb at any point within these next, you know, e- either right out of the shoot or in the, you know, any time that this team's at, at, at Latrobe can get on the field and at least show that he, you know, is the same player that he was when he left the field last time against Tennessee last year, then, then he's going to be on this 53 man roster. Uh, if, if for some reason Holcomb can't get on the field and is on active PUP for all of training camp and the preseason and has to go on reserve PUP at the start of the regular season, well, then that obviously opens up that spot for a guy like Mark Robinson. But uh, uh, is Titer Matikavich a quote-unquote lock? I, I would question that. Uh, I think there is I, – I think he still has to win this. Uh, sure, and I, I and obviously a special teams play will factor into this, but it's not like I'm not going to sit here and say unequivocally that Mark Robinson is not going to make this 53 man roster. I think there is a battle there to be had between Robinson and Matikavich. And then obviously we're going to watch the, the, uh, the health of Cole Holcomb. Right. And it, I, if I had to guess, you know, I don't know if Holcomb will land on active PUP, but I don't think he's going to be full go to start camp. They have so many, how many inside linebackers does, does this team have right now? They got the five we just mentioned on our rosters. We got Robinson six. We got Winman seven, Jacoby Winman, the undrafted free agent from Michigan State. Tyler Murray, they have eight inside linebackers on this team right now. That to me signals that Holcomb is, even if he clears active PP, does not land there to begin. He's not practicing in the full to start training camp. And that's understandable given that, as you said, only eight months removed from a very serious knee injury. So, um, that should try to create a, a couple of extra reps here for for these guys. I think you know that number five inside backer spot is a pure special team spot, especially with a, a clear you know we got Wilson, Roberts, and Queen at the least, and maybe Holcomb ahead as well if he's healthy. Uh, Medikevich is that core strong special teamer, and to me that just gives him the nod of Robinson. But you're right, he's not a lock. He's older. Robinson played a bunch on special teams last year, so this is an open battle, but. It's hard to not default and give the edge to the the more proven guy in Medikevich. Yeah, and look, when it comes to Holcomb, uh, I mean, this is paperwork shuffling here. If he's not ready, if you have any questions about Cole Holcomb going out there and being being ready to go at the start of the camp, they should put him on active PUP because once he practices once, he cannot go back on PUP. So you're just using that as a fail safe uh, part of the rule mechanism here by by paperwork shuffling and putting him on 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 active PUP to start with. So that's why the you know report day or, or the day after is going to be a very important day for Cole Holcomb. Right. But even if he's on active PUP to start the year and he's on there for a week and then comes off it, I, I don't think he's going to be a full team okay. every 11 or 11, like out of that. I think he's going to graduate and be eased into individual work, seven on seven work. And then maybe, maybe by the end of camp, get 11 on 11, you know, full participant. Okay. Yeah. That, that, that's fair. But I mean, he should not be, he should be on active PUP if he's not ready to go. Okay. Yeah. And we'll hopefully get our answer by tomorrow. All right. Cornerback. What did you keep at corner? Are we keeping the same? I think we're the same here. Joey Porter Jr., Dante Jackson, Darius Rush, Corey Trice Jr., Beanie Bishop, and Josiah Scott. Those are my six. Those are your six as mm-hmm. well, correct, Dave? Yeah, th- that is correct. And uh, look, Joseph, you know, the, 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 the report's coming out. You know, about look, it makes it easy. We know Cameron Sutton's going to be on uh, a reserve suspended list come week one. So that that puts him out of the out of out of out of the mix there, at least when it comes to initial 53 uh, Porter, Dante Jackson or Givens uh, on this roster there uh, because Josiah Scott reportedly got some of the 
first team reps there throughout the summer uh, in the slot makes him, and because he's got a little bit of NFL experience, makes it easy to kind of pencil him in there. Corey Trice Jr., we're going to learn. Look, we're, we are going to learn about a lot of these younger cornerbacks over the course of the next 45 days. That being, uh, and really Josiah Scott for that matter, because he's new to the team. Uh, Corey Trice Jr., Darius Rush, and Beanie Bishop Jr., the undrafted free agent out of uh, West Virginia, obviously uh, there. Could somebody not in this group of six wind up, or even an outsider, somebody not in our six listed wind up being on this 53 man roster? The answer to that is yes. It's just, it's going to have to de- uh, develop and expose itself as we go on here. Uh, you hope at a minimum you can get guys, young guys like Trice and Jr., Tr- Trice Jr., and Darius Rush to to step up and be kind of those, you know, at least one of them be a full-time gunner jammer, if not jammer, if not both of them there. And then obviously Beanie Bishop's uh, one of the mo- more exciting uh, young players on this roster going into this thing. Yeah, and just a programming note, Cam Sutton does not and will not have to be on the initial 53. He will just move to the reserve suspended right. list as soon as cutdowns happen. So th- there's no mechanism where he has to initially be on the 53, so that makes things easier on Pittsburgh. Yeah, a lot a lot of open battles here, Dave. Back up cornerback, Trice and Rush on the outside, slot corner, Scott, Bishop. But oh, Graylin Arnold, a lot, a lot of talk on Graylin Arnold. I uh, got to mention him. Thomas Graham might get some reps as well. So this thing is just, just wide open across the board. Yeah, it's kind of the wide receiver version to, uh, to, to maybe not as to the same degree, but to some degree uh, as a wide, re- wide receiver group. Just wondering how those kind of those final two, three spots might play out. Yeah, so a ton to watch for here. I don't think people talk about the, and you've written this too uh, in, in your initial sentence. You say, man, this position group has really changed since the end of the 2023 season. And, and boy, has it. I mean, in terms of guys that were playing last year, it's really just Joey Porter Jr. returning. I mean, Rush was on the roster and he was active, but not playing much. Trice was on the team, but on uh, injured reserves. So this group, we talk about the quarterback change, talk about the receiver change, O line change. We don't talk much about the intense cornerback change, but this is a pretty much brand new looking group. It sure is. All right. At safety, we have one difference here as well. Uh, we're both keeping Mika Fitzpatrick, Deshaun Elliott, Demonte Casey, and Miles Killebrew. You keep just four. I have a fifth in rookie Ryan Watts, again, making that change from college corner to NFL safety. Yeah, let, this goes back to me saying, uh, if I were to keep one less defensive lineman and keep six, where would I add in? And it would be at the safety position, and it would probably be uh, the rookie Ryan Watts, at least at the start of training camp. Look, they don't have many safeties on this roster anyway, right? They have six, which is about the minimum that you can have them for training camp. Right. So, you know, could someone from the outside in, you know, not on this team end up on this uh, on this roster? Yeah, I think there's I, th- I think there's a, 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 a chance that happens uh, here. But uh, uh, Ryan Watts is a guy that's going through a, a, a position switch to some degree, if you will, uh, you gotta love his length, man. I mean, he's got the length and all like that. Uh, can, can he, can he carve himself out, uh, uh, at least a special teams role where he's guaranteed to get himself where they have to dress five safeties every week. I mean, we know, uh, uh, miles Killebrew, right. Uh, he is going to be dressed in a helmet because a special teams captain and, and all, but miles Killebrew to, to, uh, on the other side of things, probably not a guy that you want to see on the field much, if any, in 2024 at, 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 at a safety position there. But, uh, uh, this number could be four. This number could be five. Uh, I feel confident that at least the four that I have listed uh, will be part of that group, barring mm-hmm. injury. It's just, will there be a fifth one out there? And will it be Ryan Watts? Right. And can Watts win a gunner job? Probably be in the mix. He's long. He's physical, decently athletic. Um, that'll be something to watch for as well. All right. Our specialists are chalk in the same. Chris Boswell as the kicker, Cameron Johnston as the punter, and Christian Kuntz as the long snapper. Really no debate or discussion right. to be had here. Although I think Matthew Wright will be a, a big summer for him to try to get on another roster because he's a, a talented kicker. He's improved his leg strength and has kicked in the NFL before. Yeah. Barring injury, those will be your three. And I mean, Wright's, Wright, Wright, Wright knows the drill at this point. Yeah. Uh, practice squad. I'm not going to read through every single name. Uh, Pittsburgh uh, can keep up to 17 as long as one of those men is Julius Wolschoff. 
the undrafted free agent linebacker. He's the international exemption player, would not count against Pittsburgh's practice squad. Have a lot of the same names on here. I don't know if you want to note anything in particular, Dave, but uh, these are the names. Uh, those won't be the 17. Uh, the, 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 this this team has shown in the past that they like to uh, sign guys on that are on other rosters, handful of three, four, five of them. Uh, so it's just a dart throw. And and I instead of just saying to be named later, I I, I chose to go with uh, 17 guys that are under contract right now. I I got a I got a good sense that. You know, maybe half of these guys I have on this list will end up on the uh, on on the practice squad. Maybe, maybe not exactly half, maybe a little less than half, but uh, just just a starting point, if you will. I did put John Rice Pumley on my practice squad, okay. so I have this team keeping four quarterbacks because I guess technically they would like to have somebody under contract, a quarterback past twenty twenty four. So that was my reason for Plumley, but maybe some scout team looks as well. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see how much how much work and reps he gets in training camp. All right, now Plumlee's on the practice squad. That's just a one year prac, one year deal. So he wouldn't be. Oh yeah, practice. I guess he would get cut. Yeah. Oh shoot, you're right. Well, either way, I mean, you feel pretty confident you could bring that guy back for right. for next year or on a reserve future type of contract situation. But but fair point there because he would be getting cut uh, to get him to the practice squad. All right, Dave. Any final thoughts here on your fifty three man roster? Uh, our differences overall, or, or what? Um, Wide we receiver, different? we are different on the fifth wide receiver. We are different on the last tight end. Uh, I have one more defensive lineman than you do. You have one more safety than I do. And I think that's the – we didn't hit the outside linebacker position there. Oh, but, shoot. Uh, I'm sorry. It feels so chalk. Um, yeah. Uh, Watt, Highsmith, Herb, Big Moon, we both have the same four. Right. Uh, and, the you know, I oh, oh, Moon – to some degree is a little bit of wild card, but I, I think mm-hmm. we we've told the people uh, dating back since, you know, all off season, why we believe moon has the inside shot at that fourth spot. Yeah, no guarantee, but I like him the most, the special teams value, the size, the strength, run defense, but there'll be David Perales. There'll be a uh, Kyron Johnson. Who's not get talked about much at all. Uh, who's on this team to, to close out 2023. So those guys will also be fighting for spots. All right. All right, so uh, pretty good differences for for a pre camp yeah. prediction. I think you know, you know probably more than what we typically get. So right, that that's good to have that discussion, that back and forth. What, uh, what fun is it if we have my identical? You know, right? Exactly. All right, so we'll uh, make a new prediction. I'll probably do mine either right before the first preseason game or right after the first preseason game, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of changes from there. Dave, we got to try to fly through some of these 90 and 30s. Try to wrap things up here. We've last finished. We lasted what Tyler Murray, Ogunjobi, and Patterson, I believe. Or do we do Perales, P. Ryan, and Pickens? I don't remember talking about P. Ryan. So I don't either. All right, let's go with let's go with David Perales, Michael P. Ryan, and George Pickens to pick things up on the ninety and thirty. Perales, second year guy, the only undrafted free agent from last year's class that's still on the team. He's lost weight this offseason, down about fifteen pounds. He recently said in an interview. Just mentioned him trying to fight with Moon for special teams value for a spot on the 53. Yeah, look, he's he's uh, we just got to see him show up in some of these preseason games more so than last year. And he's going to have to uh, show that he could be a better special teams player. His path to the 53 is very, 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 very tough. Not impossible, but uh, he's got his work cut out for him this summer. As does LaMichael P. Ryan, who does have some NFL experience, but mentioned him. Your top three running backs on the 53, pretty locked in. P. Ryan will have to then battle Edwards and Ward for a practice squad spot. Yeah, tough road for him. Even probably getting to the practice squad seems to be a little bit tough at this point here. So a lot would have to happen for him to stay in Pittsburgh past the uh, preseason. For these running backs, can you block? Can you do something on special teams? Can you catch? Can you add additional value outside of being a pure running back? That is always going to be important for these backup running backs to try to to make their mark uh, and and stick in some capacity. All right, George Pickens, there ain't a lot to say here. I mean, he's going to be your top wide receiver. You're expecting another jump with him. Uh, You expect him to use use more uh, some slants, some in breaking routes. I mean, look, you, you're expecting a very solid season out of George Pickens, even if they don't go out and get a, uh, you know, all the talk's going to be, man, if they don't go out and get a bigger playmaker on the other side, uh, how's, how, you know, how are other teams going to defend him? Will he still be able to put up the numbers? Good. Number one wide receivers always find a way to get the football. Besides the kind of attitude and, 
off field, whatever you want to couch it as, what is putting that aside? What is one thing you want to see Pickens improve on in his third NFL season? Uh, just, uh, mastering the route tree more, I think. Yeah. I think in particular being better at the break point and creating more separation. I, I, Doug Whaley, who former Bill's GM, a long time Steelers executive, uh, now an analyst, he called Pickens a one, one trick pony. And that felt a little too harsh and not acknowledging the improvement Pickens made with his route tree, greatly improving his yak last year was huge. But I do think Pickens is not the most natural, fluid route runner, and I want to see him be a bit better in terms of dropping his hips and being able to create more separation on things beyond just slants and, of course, then just beyond being a vertical uh, go ball machine. There was improvement last year. I think it can continue, but I want to see him really, as you said, kind of refine that route tree and his own ability to, to break down, change direction, create space. Yeah, look, I, I'm expecting more receptions uh, from him uh, within 10 yards of the line of scrimmage. You know, yeah, um, I, I think so too. And just a little more varied. He says he's playing in the slot more, and so maybe some more when you're in the slot, the route tree really opens up because you know leverage doesn't dictate your route nearly as much as it does on the outside. So I'll be watching for Pickens' alignment as well. His slot work went from 11 percent as a rookie to 20 percent as a sophomore. We'll see what it comes in at this year. And I think from a uh, from an attitude standpoint, they would do well to get him involved in every game early on. Yeah, for sure. And rightfully so, the talent uh, demands it, I would say, as right. well. All right, Joey Porter Jr., uh, dance partner. I just read about training camp matchups to watch in Pickens Porter Part 2. Should be an excellent one to watch. I think even more exciting this year now that Porter is no longer the wide-eyed rookie. Porter started the, the back half of last year. Is this team's clear number one corner? Should shadow top receivers? He's going to face a bunch of talented mm-hmm. receivers this year, Dave. No question about that. So what are you watching for? with Porter and camp and for his second NFL season. Look, uh, just continue on the progress that he made. Once he started getting into the lineup last year, started following guys around. You expect more of that this year. Uh, The penalties is the thing to watch with Joey Porter Jr. I think first and foremost in his second season, he's got to, He's got to diminish those penalties. Got to get a little bit stouter against run when he's out out there, out there on the edge. But uh, as far as coverage, I thought he made strides in that. I'm expecting that same kind of player. Like to see him come away with a couple more interceptions, a couple of takeaways, a couple more passes, defense, and more. You know, look, he's got to limit those penalties. Penal penalized 12 times last year, and unfortunately led the Steelers in that statistical category as a rookie. How many of those were DPIs? There were a couple of weird where he was like lining up off sides. There were certainly some PIs and some holdings. I don't know exactly how many he had last year, but it wasn't it wasn't all of them, obviously. Is some of that, do you just kind of accept some of that? I mean, obviously you want to cut down on penalties as much as possible, but is some of that just the cost of doing business for a long, you know, press corner like him that's going to face top receivers consistently? All right, I'll read them off to you. Face mask, face mask, defensive holding, defensive offsides, illegal use of hands, defensive pass interference, defensive holding, defensive offside, defensive pass interference, defensive pass interference, defensive pass interference, defensive holding. So there's a lot of clutching okay, and grabbing there's eight. going on. In yeah, there's eight. I, but, but to the question, I mean, obviously, again, you want to cut things down. No question about that. But. Would you rather, is, is it a, is it a woe or sick him kind of thing? We sit there and say, he's going to get called for a couple. It's going to happen. That's the mentality he's got to play with because he's, he's going to make enough plays to justify the occasional, you know, holding or PI. Uh, the correct answer would be yes or no. Uh, <laughs> the, the proper answer to your question is I don't have, to, I don't want to take my shoes off to have to count uh, his penalties. They, they, they need to be. Uh, about half of that 12. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I think you half is probably a good way to the old Eddie Murphy, Murphy half uh, is probably the way I'll, I'll phrase this with Porter. But my, my point is, is just to say that he's going to get penalized a couple times. Sure. But it just you, you need him to play big, need him to play to that level and hopefully clean up the margins a little bit. But I'm a, I, I can live with a couple of penalties because I think the talent and what he can do at his best is, is really high level. What I, and I said this last year about Joey Porter Jr., uh, he needs to get in, in touch with the equipment 
company with the equipment yes. people. He needs to get in, in 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 coordination with the companies that make these gloves and all. And he mm-hmm. needs to look at the color chart and, and and the logo of the opposing team and what uniforms they're going to be wearing. And he needs to get gloves that match those. <laughs> uh, seriously, not a joke. That's one hundred percent serious. He should. Right, because uh, and and uh, that that might help. Yeah, it, it's little tricks to the trade. They like all that. they all hold. <laughs> right, but don't make it more obvious. Don't wear right. black gloves with a white jersey because it becomes a lot more obvious, a lot more visible. So I, I, he actually against Arizona wore white gloves and had a little pull, I think, on Hollywood Brown that did not get called, but she really didn't notice because it's white gloves on a white jersey. So little things like that are honestly important to help. Again, if you can save yourself a penalty, that's huge. Right, and who do they play the first couple of games out of shoot? Couple of uh, dark. Uh, pro- the, uh, I would imagine the Falcons are going to wear that red, right? And the Bron- Broncos probably going to wear that uh, that that orange. I would go ahead and get those on order right now. <laughs> a, a couple of sets to match. I I would I did, I would say look I I take that to Home Depot. <laughs> and, you're, you're doing and, paint swatches or yeah, something? Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm color matching those gloves. Yeah, uh, yeah. That 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 way they blend in there. But it, look, look, that that that's that's one of the biggest concerns with him is the the clutching and the grabbing and the penalties. Mm-hmm. I think. Yeah, I, I think it's certainly that. I think also he's he's not been a, a full time player wire to wire. As you said a, a episode or so ago, he was kind of eased into action last year. Dime package is only the first really month of the season. He's going to now have to be this team starting number one corner from week one through you know end of the regular season, week eighteen, and hopefully beyond. And he's got to be able to kind of mentally and physically handle that. I think he certainly can, but it will be something he'll have. To do, he's gonna take his lumps when you're facing like top receivers all the time. You're not gonna win all those battles, and so those, there's probably gonna be some more negative plays this year, just because when you're facing top receivers, they're they're, they're gonna make their catches as well. But uh, I, I'm really excited about Porter. I think he had a really strong rookie year, even as he gets typecast as this kind of like press only man corner. He can be that, but I thought his zone coverage was better. I thought his tackling improved tremendously at the start of last year. There was no Oklahoma drill in training camp. He was a mess in. Early in the season, not a good tackler. End of the season, became a much more effective drag down, wrap up tackler. Um, I think he's a more well rounded corner than people give him credit for right now. And look, if he wants to be considered one of the top 10 cornerbacks in the league, he's got to go out and do it uh, and, and show it, you know. Uh, and I, I suspect he's going to have a good season. I'm expecting that. And a couple picks would be nice. Uh, one interception last year, that jump ball against Baltimore. Not, not that it's the sale end all, but uh, that'll help you get some Pro Bowl and some more national recognition. All right. Wellington Prev- Prevalon, uh, uh, who was signed later in the offseason, not not a lot to talk about there. His, his path is extremely uh, tough, even to the practice squad. You know, he, he will do himself a huge service just by staying, staying on this roster throughout uh, all of the preseason. Yeah, curious midseason or mid off season addition. Again, I wonder if it speaks to you know potential Hayward hold in, maybe somebody else you know limiting reps and Ogan Joby or whatever. But yeah, former Packer, uh, Rutgers uh, alum, uh, but yeah, reps in itself will be difficult to come by in a pretty loaded and deep off uh, defense line room. All right, Mike Cole Pruitt, he's got to show me at least why Arthur Smith brought him over from Atlanta. Uh, in, in the story, uh, 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 I want to see more. Uh, I want to see a more dominant blocker. I want to see what he does on special teams. Him and uh, uh, obviously Hot Rod uh, Rodney Williams is going to be in in a, probably a pretty good battle for a, a, a roster spot here. Somebody that can hopefully help teach the system to the tight end room. I think it was no coincidence that of all the, you know, they brought in a bunch of Arthur Smith uh, carryovers, but at different position groups, they brought in Patterson for the running back room, Jefferson for the receiver room, also Scotty Miller, Pruitt for the tight end room. So a lot of guys that can kind of help teach and subtly kind of help these guys learn the Arthur Smith system along the way. Inline blocking is his calling card. Um, Really, it's up to, to, I think, Rodney Williams, if he can improve his inline blocking, then Williams may make that uh, roster spot over him. If not, maybe Pruitt as that number four tight end. All right. Where to? Patrick Queen, um, you know, obviously record setting free agent contract for Pittsburgh, defecting from Baltimore, should be the three down guy, green dot guy. Want to see him in camp against you know, Jalen Warren, against Pat Fryermuth, 
Um, hopefully this team's best off a linebacker since Ryan Chazier. Yeah, look, just live up to uh, the expectations, and those expectations are pretty high. Uh, obviously, this team went through the inside linebackers last year. Hopefully, he's going to be there and stabilize it. Hopefully, this is the best inside linebacker group as a whole with him anchoring it that we've seen in years. Yeah, no question about that. And just being the communicator, that hub of communication, that three-down linebacker, um, something he didn't have to always do in Baltimore, especially once they acquired Roquan Smith. Uh, can he do that uh, in, in Pittsburgh? Can he play the, the same level without Roquan Smith and all pro next to him? He's capable of that. But those are some of the outstanding questions on Patrick Queen. All right. Uh, Plumley. we've already spent a lot of time talking about him. Yeah. Number four quarterback. Will he do anything else? Kick returner. I still think he should have been moved to receiver. Um, when he does play quarterback, to me, the biggest thing was accuracy, the inconsistency, the scattershotness of it. But athletic, he can run, gets in the preseason game, maybe a Josh Dobbs kind of feel with him running around and making some plays with his legs. All right. A Landon Roberts. All I will say about a Landon Roberts is give me the Landon Roberts we saw last year. Yeah, really impressive guy. What an important, underrated free agent signing he was. A hammer, a thumper, a tone setter. His coverage, though, was better than I even thought it would be. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's ever going to be an elite coverage guy, but the metrically and our charting, he was good. The tape was good. Um, a tone setter, tough dude. Really a big fan of Landon Roberts. Rubber stamp that guy for me in 2024, and they should be fine with him. Mark Robinson in a different situation at the same position. Inside linebacker mentioned him. Medikevich signing really squeezes that roster spot. He was entering camp looking like the number five inside backer. What is Cole Holcomb's health? How could that impact Robinson's spot? That'll be something to watch. But for himself, can he just earn this team's trust? Can they trust him above the neck and whatever issues they have with him? It's hard to say for sure. I think he's a talented guy. I think he has made plays, but there's been something about him that just kind of has been holding him back from seeing a larger role. And for him to show that he's going to need snaps. So at the end of the preseason, here's something to think about. Is Mark Robinson going to lead the defense in preseason snaps play? I think he should. I don't think he will. I think That's he should. Many. You think he will? I don't know the answer to that. I think he should. That's my okay. that's my point. You need let's find out who he is, even if it's against uh future furniture movers. Let's get him out there in a lot of situations, even though it's preseason ball, and give him the opportunity to at least make the mark. Yeah, I think he'll certainly get a, a decent amount of reps. I think probably some corner or safety ends up getting the most just because you got so many inside backers, and I want to see Peyton Wilson uh, play a lot for sure. But yeah, this guy should get snaps, should get an opportunity. Um, you know, Medikevich will get some time, but I'm not really jonesing to see Medikevich on defense too much right. in the preseason. Uh, you can see a little bit, obviously, but Robinson should get more snaps than Medikevich on defense at the and, least. And another guy that needs some preseason snaps is Darius Rush, the next guy on the on 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 the list here. Uh, especially special team snaps. Uh, he's got he's got to earn a roster spot, plain and simple. Yeah, he was a guy that was the highest draft pick cut last year with the Colts. Uh, High fifth round pick, a guy I was high on out of South Carolina, but he was athletic man coverage corner. He's dealt with injuries throughout his career. That's kind of held him back. Uh, but yeah, just didn't get to learn a ton about him. Last year, he played, I think, 40 some odd defensive snaps, some dime work, some package work early they on. Great either. Gave up a couple of touchdowns. They, they left a lot to be desired in his preseason play last year. Okay. Yeah. And then in Pittsburgh, he dropped that pick against Tennessee that would have sealed the game, although Quan Alexander picked it off right after that. But uh, again, just kind of a clean slate with Rush. Don't know a ton about him at the NFL level. Second year, some stability will do him some good, though. Bouncing around so much last year, getting cut by the Colts, going to Kansas City, and then picked up by Pittsburgh midseason to have a full offseason with one team, no longer a rookie. Should hopefully provide a bit more stability and less head spinning for a guy like Darius Rush, but there's really no guarantees. But there is an open backup cornerback spot for the taking. Hopefully he can take it. Absolutely. Josiah Scott, next one on the list. If there's a golden opportunity award to be issued ahead of camp for the 90 uh, one man roster, does he win it? I think so. I think he's up there at least. I mean, who's this team? <laughs> Welcome back to another discussion, Dave, pre-training right. camp of who's this team slot corner going to be. Had it last year, had it the year after Mike Hilton, I've had it basically every single season since Hilton left for Cincinnati. And this year, it's with Sutton shelved. It's Scott. 
It's Bishop. It's Arnold. It's Graham. Scott has experience. He was effectively the Eagles slot corner in 2022, uh, then fell out of favor last year. So I think ultimately it'll be a committee approach. That's what how they've been doing it post Mike Hilton, the rundown guy, a pass down guy. I don't know which bucket uh, Scott will fall into, probably more pass down guy than rundown guy, but just can he show something to stick? Yeah, win it. Win the roster spot. As as Adrian told Rocky, win. You know, I haven't heard just, that one from you in a while. Yeah, yeah. yeah just win. Uh, got a lot. Got a lot to learn about him. Obviously, uh, new in a Steelers uniform, but supposedly ran you know some first team stuff there during the off season. So let's see it. Are they making Rocky movies still? Or are they done? Is Sylvester Stallone oh, done? Oh, they're done. I, as a kid, man, after one and two came out, I couldn't wait for three to come out. Three came out. I enjoyed it. I could re- back when I was a kid. I could recite every line of Rocky three <laughs> uh, throughout the movie. There, uh, uh, so much so I was looking forward to the next Rocky movies. But after that, it got into Rocky. Uh, I got. How many have they made this? For? They, uh, I know they just made too, one like a year too, or two ago. Too many. That's how many. <laughs> Like the Fast and Furious, but yeah. do you think they're done? Or do you think they're going to do one more? I don't know. I I haven't even watched any of the the the, the mm. more recent ones there. All right, all right. Segwaying into Isaac Sayamalu, who like Rocky will try to beat up some guys in the trenches, and so starting left guard, his spot safe, uh, a good first year for him. And I think while not an elite tandem, say Malu and Daniels can be a very good guard tandem. Look, uh, you, you should be the leader in that room, you would think. And just stay healthy, Isaac. Just stay healthy. And I'd like to see him maybe on the move a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, quiet giant doesn't say much, but uh, I think a guy that Troy Fautanu's talked about and leaning on some and a uh, young guy like Mason McCormick can, can lean on and watch how these guys work, how they approach. And uh, an older guy that's professional, takes care of his body. Those types of things that young guys can learn from. Absolutely. All right. Running back Aaron Champlin, uh, former, where'd he go? Harvard, I think. Uh, speedster had success there, but um, with you know, additions of guys like Edwards and uh, P. Ryan Ward, it's going to be tough for reps for Champlin. He's got to stay on the roster all off season, first and foremost. Uh, that is a chore in and of itself when it when you look at uh, the you know the, this uh, depth and how things you know, happen with injuries on other, you know, other groups and all like that. Uh, if he can at least stay on the roster all summer, he'll, he, he might have, and, and, you know, make, make, take advantage of whatever playing time he gets during the preseason. If any, then he'll have a shot at the practice squad. He did have a pretty impressive college career. He took a year off mysteriously. It was a couple of years midway through his college career and uh, left for a season and then came back and, and had success. But yeah, uh, just just tough path there for him. Also a tough path for defense lineman Jacob Slade. I don't know why this team has, how many defense linemen do they literally have on, on this 91 right now? It's got to be a dozen. It's, it's quite a few, that's for sure. And he's going to be at the bottom end of the lines, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's training camp. You're going to have depth, and you're going to give Hayward, even if he does practice days off, and probably the same with Open Joby. So I get the value of having camp depth there, but it does feel like they're like someone's going to get cut here from the steel line mm-hmm. room if there's an injury at you know receiver or whatever position pops up. So yeah, his main chore is just to stay stay survive. out there in Latrobe, you know. All right, uh, let's see. Cam Sutton talked about him. I mean, obviously, not going to impact this team until week ten at the earliest. You know, slot corner. Hopefully, when he's out there, uh, and he can participate. I wonder. I wonder how many reps he will get, knowing that he's not going to help this team. Do you, do you give him some reps, or do you really just focus on the guys that will be there and available potentially for week one? Man, if I'm them, it's such a short. I mean, even though it feels like those those three weeks last a long time, uh, it's 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 not an overall practice time and preseason time. I think you kind of know. Obviously, he'll get some reps out there, but I the onus should be on finding out what you're going to do when you don't have him. Corey Trice Jr. Big second year for him. We'll see availability, level up participation. Just didn't get to learn a ton about him. He was impressive in that brief. Four and a half practices last year, most of which were not in pads. But I know my re- recollection was that he did have a couple of impressive moments before getting hurt. Yeah, I think the key thing is, is can you get him to uh, uh, assume the role of next man up? You know, that's that's uh, hey, he's got to make the roster. But assuming he can get himself that far and obviously special teams play will play into that. But can 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 they gain confidence in him of him potentially being that next guy off the bench? 
yeah, to show good technique. Can you be big and physical and play clean and walk that line? Um, and can you maybe, you know, get an impact as a gunner? That's also going to be a guy that'll probably be in the mix for one of those uh, starting jobs. Right. And then Jonathan Ward, who is field by Steelers Depot, uh, hate right now. I, I'm kidding. Uh, but Ward, a veteran, signed uh, as a tryout guy at a rookie minicamp, well rounded, uh, can catch, a little undersized, not maybe the, the power back mold that uh, Pittsburgh generally gravitates towards, but uh, a guy that I think has good practice squad material. Yeah, I think he's, what, played 70 total regular season offensive snaps since entering the NFL and 553 more on special teams. So uh, circle his name to maybe as a guy to watch on special teams during the preseason. That's a lot of snaps, 553. Damn. And that's going to give him staying power to stick because obviously Harris, Warren, and Patterson, besides kick returns, are not giving you any special teams value. And typically you want a running back that can do something uh, last year, that was, you know, that's why God and Iwabuke was getting work over McFarland last year. So uh, I, I think they're going to keep, I, I think they're keep at least one of Ward or, or Edwards. And Edwards at Georgia was also a pretty accomplished uh, teamer. So I think one of those guys, their path is special teams because it's something the running backs in front of them do not do or cannot do. Amen. All right, I think we'll do. Uh, we'll finish up the ninety and thirty for tomorrow's episode. I know we'll recap uh, day one of reporting, but we will have time tomorrow to go through the uh, final uh, list of names here. We're running a bit long right now. Um, uh, us run long? Never. 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 Well, that's how we end season fourteen. It's how we'll start season fifteen. I'm sure as well. Just want a quick note here. Article I wrote yesterday on uh, new quarterbacks coach Tom Arth got to speak to a couple of former coaches and players of him when he coached at John Carroll, a D3 school where he's uh, you know probably best known for getting to know just what Coach Arth is like, what he values, and what he'll bring to Pittsburgh in a really critical year with all these new quarterbacks and a new quarterback coach. So you can go on the site and just search uh, Tom Arth. You'll see that and check out the article. It's my kind of feature piece before training camp kicks off. All right. Shall we get to some the email machine? Yeah, let's get this to read emails and close out today's show. All right, old buddy James Cicinelli back in our email machine. Alex, how do mm. we say hi and thank you to you when you are at training camp? Where is the best place to sit and watch so you can see all three fields or just one? Do we have to bring our own chair blanket to sit on? Any other tips? Great. Uh, keep up the great work and can't wait to say hi on the first day of padded practice. James, make sure to bring a Sharpie because Alex does not like to sign in pen. Right. Oh, my God. <clears throat> All right. Well, let's just <laughs> bypassing that whole thing. Um, yeah. No, great questions. There is a bleacher area, so you don't have to bring a chair, but the bleachers do up uh, do fill up pretty quickly, especially on, on weekend practices. Uh, there are, are hill areas. So if you want to sit on the hill, you can bring a chair, uh, probably a good idea, depending on, you know, how you want to uh, sit out. Um, they primarily practice on the field closest to the bleachers in, in uh, individual and warm up. still, uh, defense will go on the, the farthest field away. You can still see what they're doing. It's not super intense or exciting. So I wouldn't worry about, uh, all three fields that much. And then for me, I try to get 50 yard line about three quarters of the way up pretty easy to spot. I'm the nerd with the binoculars and the paper and the notes and all the, uh, you know, just nerdiness of, of myself there. Certainly, you know, feel free to say hi, uh, preferably before practice. I usually try to take off pretty quickly after practice to get home and start writing the report, but certainly feel free uh, before practice begins to come up and say hello and appreciate all the support. All right, Ted Webb got a similar type question. Once again, Dave and Alex, uh, thanks for your uh, team. Great job. Thanks for getting us through the offseason with the great content. I've been a listener and reader of the website for years, and no one does it better. With Alex off to camp this week, besides paper, pencil, and binoculars, what are Alex's must-have items each day at camp? And one last thing, a few podcasts ago, you were talking about maybe an app. Any update on that? Once again, thanks, and you guys keep doing what you're doing. Uh, as far as the app, we're working on it. We got a prototype i think about ready to go there's all that paperwork now that's involved with getting it submitted and all like that so i don't have a time frame of when that thing will actually be released but as the as the kids like to say we are efforting that uh alex you uh what are the must-have items you take every day i pack light to be honest it's basically that it's it's a water bottle um it's binoculars it's notes um you know, pen and paper. I mean, the, the only kind of crazy thing, and it's not even that crazy, is my waterproof. It's uh, the company's right in the rain, not a sponsor, but I've 
bought from them forever now. I think they were like a former army surplus store that kind of became more of just a commercial uh, company, but it's waterproof pen, waterproof paper, because it's always going to be some rain days. They're calling for, I think, some rain Thursday. So hopefully that holds off. But that is kind of my go-to uh, to at least keep my notes uh, dry, even if I'm not during practice. All right. Uh, Luke writes in, Alex, are you bringing your stopwatch to training camp again this year? With no punter battle to track hang times, why is there only one punter, he asked. Can, can I request some times on the conditioning test on the first day? In the fantasy world I live in, when working out, I'd like to know how much time I need to shave off of my 8 by 100s to avoid <laughs> the PUP list. I assume there are different cutoffs for the different position group so i'm curious how much faster i'd need to be to catch isaac sayamalo uh he also is stopwatch and actual watch or just the phone app we are all super excited uh for training camp and alex's daily updates can't wait for starters uh we are not privy alex is not privy to watching the conditioning test on the first day so we hate to disappoint you there luke but uh what about uh what about a stopwatch alex yeah, it'll be there. Uh, as for why one punter, I mean, it just shows their level of confidence in Cameron Johnston. You do have some concern about overusing his leg, but they can always substitute the, uh, I guess, the jugs machine. They can kind of angle the direction of that and just have that be the punter for reps if they need to. So that's kind of a way to work around the second quote unquote punter. Uh, I don't I have an actual stopwatch. No, it's my phone app, um, but I, I don't. The way that I'm able to do it is uh, it, it's kind of stopwatch like where I, I can just hold my hand down on my phone and then release. And it, it, I think it gives pretty accurate time. So overall, so even if it doesn't have the official stopwatch, I'm pretty confident because I've been doing it for so long and be able to kind of test in different uh, uh, styles and methods to make sure my times are, are pretty accurate. I was literally getting the same times on jugs machines in the past. So I feel like I've had a pretty good rhythm and routine of, of how to get things as accurate as possible. I will still uh, time the Johnston punts because just to get a good metric and barometer for him, hang time has been a concern with Johnston. It's not his strongest suit. And so I do want to see what the numbers show on, on Johnston, but uh, it, it should be an overall a, a good addition and upgrade at punter for Pittsburgh. All right. Randy writes in with the current 90 man roster, Name your ideal 11 and their positions for the kickoff return unit. Oh, man. If you could also provide some rationale, it would be much appreciated. Would you put in any stars? Oh, my. We're, no way we're going to answer that one. <laughs> uh, that we, we need a whole another 90 minutes to probably work through an exercise on doing something like that. Uh, just just to give them a little something, any any key names you, you would be in your ideal uh, 11 on a kickoff return unit based on the 91 man roster right now. Yeah. I mean, you know, traditionally there's some linebackers, there's some tight ends that are out there. You probably see Pruitt, you know, probably see uh, Connor Hayward out there. Well, you know, I, I don't know. And, and typically, you know, when they do kickoffs in camps past, it's not exactly the most exciting period, but all eyes will be on it this year for sure. I wonder if they're going to go live a couple times and, you know, I don't know if, I'm not going to say it's ideal, but I want to see some offensive linemen out there just to see what it looks like. Can it work? Can you put Dylan Cook? Can you put Mason McCormick? Can you put one of those more athletic big guys and just, you know, if it doesn't work, okay, then we'll scrap it. We'll try it in camp and preseason and see if it uh, can be something to work with or not. So I want to, I want to get an offensive lineman out there and kind of see how it looks. Good answer. Good answer. Good answer. Uh, Chris Lookhart. Good morning, men. Obviously, Peyton Wilson is a speed demon. I he hesitate to mention them in the same sentence, but could he become what Shazier was at some point? Shazier was my favorite Steeler for a while and I have always desired someone to fill his shoes. Does Wilson have the skills to actually do it? Have a great time at Camp Alex, stay safe. I will say this about, I mean, yeah, he's got a lot to show before we're putting him in the same conversation as, as, as prime Ryan Shazier. I will say this. He runs very well. He reads very well. I, I don't know if he get, has the ability or has really shown much of getting as skinny, maybe as Ryan Shazier did in some of the Ryan, Ryan, sometimes to a fault, would just automatically choose to go under instead of over or something like that in, in some gaps. But he he had that forgivable burst change of direction to in 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 order to do it. Some of the big plays that Shazier would made would be him knifing through, right? Uh either mm -hmm. over, over or under. Uh I look, I've I've said it several times since Peyton Wilson was drafted. Uh if this kid can stay healthy. 
Uh, he is and it he is within my mind the most uh of the draft class the player to get the most excited about uh, as as far as long term. I expect him to be on the field at some point during his rookie season. Who knows how that works out towards the later end of the season? Maybe he gets him. So he has got to do what, uh, and I said this last night on the live stream. He's got to do what Nick Herbig did last year when he's on the field defensively. Let's make make it where we have to talk about it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, if he does that, and he's obviously going to be a core special teamer as well too. Uh, I mean, could he, I, the short, short, short question is, is can he potentially become what Shazier was at his prime? Uh, I, I don't want to, I don't want to put him in a box and say no, that he can't. I mean, he is a playmaker guy. He did a lot of things much like Shazier did at Ohio state. Remember Shazier was moved around a lot, was asked to rush from the edge and, 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 and get out there on the overhang sometimes and, and follow a guy down the field and stuff like that. So I'm not going to put him in a box and say, no, that he can't, but he's got to, he's got to show us those things at the NFL level, right? But he does have the skill set, the traits to, to potentially maybe get in that conversation. Yeah, I mean, I'm excited for him. I know that health was the concern. It's why he fell, but it wasn't short-term health. It wasn't that he wasn't healthy right now. It was long-term longevity. And so you're getting a third-round pick with first-round talent. I think he'll show it. I think he's going to have a great training camp. Um, yeah, and I think he's going to compel this team to play him in some role right away. But we got to see it. we got to get eyes on it. Um, and once the pads come on, it'll be a little bit different story for him, and he knows that. So I, I think the sky's the limit for this guy. I'm really excited for his First training camp in Pittsburgh and in the NFL. Absolutely. All right. And we got through about five or six uh, email questions to make the masses happy there. Anything you'd like to add before we get out of here, Alex? Welcome to the season, Dave. Mm -hmm. We're about ready to dive into this thing. Um, deep end of the pool. We'll be back tomorrow. Um, again, we'll do the we'll do a Wednesday show, but it'll be later in the day as we will wait to recap uh, report day and from the players and, and Coach Tomlin, any roster moves, any contracts potentially that were to get done. So welcome back. Yeah, uh, and thank you, everyone. Uh, this, I guess, officially concludes, what did we say, season 14 of the Terrible Podcast. I uh, can't thank everybody enough. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for everybody who has sat in on these things and the interviews that we've had. Uh, it was a very successful season. Look forward to kicking off uh, season 15 of the Terrible Podcast on Wednesday. So in the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter slash X at Steeders Depot. Follow Alex at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, theterriblepodcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to donate to the cause, steedersdepot.com. Hit the donate button. Also, if you like an ad-free version of the site, steedersdepot.com. Hit the ad-free button. Follow the directions that way. So, until tomorrow, Wednesday, as always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.